Hi, I guess it's time to get started. I'm, is this, these are on, is it live, too live? Good, good, great. We're on, I think, good, good. I'm Sean Schmidt, I'm uh, chair of the Aperon Committee and would like to welcome you to Aperon today. Um, there have been quite a few wonderful presentations. I hear this thing humming at me. Could we turn, that's the, Anyway, um, typically with one of these things, you want to always uh, introduce, here we go, is that the one? Maybe. Maybe? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay, good, because it was like ringing up here. It was weird. Um, okay, so typically with these things, you always want to introduce uh, special people in the audience and that kind of stuff whenever you first start out. So we're going to do that, kind of, sort of. Um, uh, there's uh, quite a few people that we should probably recognize, like the people that are on the back of the program that have supported one way or another. There are probably some groups that we actually left off. And Normally we'd ask people to stand up and, and give them a big round of applause, but we're not going to do that. We're going to hold our applause for a minute. Um, okay, who else? There's the actual Aperon Committee. They're looking on page 34, and we could ask them to stand up and give them a big round of applause too, but we're not going to. Okay? <laughs> All right, who else? <coughs> well, we've got all these different student presentations that all have mentors associated with them, right? So we could have the mentors. We could have them all stand up, give them a big round of applause, but we're not going to, okay? Because the reason we're here, well, oh, there's one other group, friends and family. I know there's some friends and family that came that that's an important part of having that support system in order to be able to do these kind of projects. And we could ask them to stand up and give them a big round of applause, but we're not. Because the reason we're here is to celebrate what our students have done, and you'll see the list of presenters that are on this page. And what I'd like to ask you to do is actually to stand up and give them a big round of applause. For our students. Yeah, stand up. Yes, stand up and give them a big round of applause. That's why we're here. That's what this is about, is to celebrate the wonderful things that they've done. Okay? Um, and faculty, if you see these folks in your classes this next week, call them out and say, great job. I, I appreciate that presentation, whatever it was. Okay? There's two other things we need to do before we're going to get started on the last lecture. Uh, Regina Castle is going to come up and present an award for the poster design. And then Donna Lyon's going to come up and uh, introduce our last lecturer. So, Regina. Good afternoon. Um, every spring in my publication layout and design class, although it's not called that anymore, uh, students get an assignment to design a poster for Aperon. And then all the posters go to the committee and they look over them and they choose which poster that they uh, will select as the publication material, the publicity materials for APRON. This year we had two students who had very different designs, but the committee liked them both, and so we decided to print them both, and I, I think it worked out fine. Um, one of my students is here today, and so I'll have Jeff Daly come forward. And this is his poster design, which is also on your cover of your programs, and was also on the postcards that went out. So we are very pleased to present Daisy Dirk. And now it's Jeff's turn. Well, it's really my pleasure to uh, introduce the last lecturer for today, Howard Faulkner. Um, I want to let you know Howard the way that um, I know Howard, and so. I was thinking about the, the things that are most important to me. And um, probably least important to me is the fact that he actually had a very distinguished academic career prior to coming to, to Washburn. He joined the um, faculty in um, 1972, rose through the academic ranks, um, served most recently before his retirement as chair of the English department. And although that is a very important aspect of, of Howard, 
What I, what I remember the most is the way in which he was devoted to his students because I took incredible inspiration from that. There were a number of late nights in Morgan Hall where the uh, smell of pizza encompassed the second floor. And that was because the modern English grammar class was having a review session that um, their faculty member, Howard, was leading for them. And to, to sustain them in their efforts, he provided pizza. And I always took a great deal of pleasure in that and thought that that really did show just how much he cared about his students. The second reason, way that I remember um, Howard is, is that he was an incredible scholar. Um, I know many of you in the audience are familiar with the work that he did with his collaborator Virginia Pruitt on the Menninger Letters, but there was also a great body of work on the teaching of composition. And of course, my all-time favorite is the rules of the game, which I hold near and dear when I'm uh, concerned about English grammar. Um, so he was an incredible scholar, and, and that was personified in his willingness to stretch himself. He was the recipient of a number of Fulbrights, where he did not just do his scholarship in the comfort of his office on the um, whatever floor of, of Morgan, but in fact he ventured to other countries and learned, and most importantly was always willing to bring what he learned back to his students. So, I certainly rem remember many um, conversations with him about his wonderful Fulbright experiences, and thank him very much for allowing me to have those experiences vicariously. Finally, I think um, I appreciate Howard most because he was such a wonderful colleague. Um, in various positions at Washburn, uh, there were often opportunities to collaborate with, with other departments, and I always felt comfortable seeking Howard out um, mostly because I knew he was going to be receptive, but also because I knew he was going to uh, be willing to save me from myself and tell me when an idea was not quite the caliber of an idea that, that I thought. And I always ex appreciated his great insights because I knew that those insights were um, truly from the motivation of taking care of students and making the Washburn experience um, one of incredible excitement and intellectual activity for our students. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my friend and colleague, Howard Faulkner, for an incredible last lecture, the first of many, I hope. I think Donna gave away about half the lecture. Um, <laughs> When Sean first called and asked if I do the last lecture, I hesitated briefly, but then I remembered that Snooky had just gotten $32,000 for speaking at Rutgers, and I thought, surely I'm worth as much as Snooky. So I said yes. Um, I was a little disheartened when Dean McQuarrie said he'd only pay me half that much, but I, I swallowed my pride, and uh, here I am, and I'm waiting for my check. Yeah. It's, um, in the mail. it's in the mail, that's what I thought, yes. Um, I'm completing, as Donna said, 45 years of teaching, 39 of them at Washburn, so it probably is time I give a last lecture and turn it over to the next generation, or since I've been here so long, it's not really the next generation, it's you know, two generations down or so. I can make that sound maybe a little more adventurous if I say that in those 45 years I taught at six di different universities in five different countries on three different continents. Um, after I accepted, then I thought, well, what am I going to talk about? First I thought, okay, I'll just do some sort of genial general reminiscences about my time here. But then Aperon is supposed to be scholarly, so I thought I should go in a more scholarly direction. Um, I used to always teach, it's very hard to use the past tense for these kind of things, I used to teach American literature, and Emily Dickinson is one of my favorite poem, poets. I love teaching her, her poetry is short. I thought that was very good, so I was going to work up a lecture, Madness, Mortality, and Morbidity, in the poems of Emily Dickinson. And I, as I did like the title, I wasn't sure that was in the spirit of <laughs> celebration of today. Uh, so I ruled that one out. And then another course that Donna mentioned, um, 
modern English grammar I love to teach. So I thought that would be good. We could have a nice section, an interactive session of diagramming sentences. <laughs> we could do some practice exercises distinguishing between whoever and whomever. Uh, we could think about the mysteries of the infant, uh, the mysteries of the infant, infinite. Uh, the mysteries of the infinitive. <laughs> <laughs> well played, Josh. Which, <laughs> which is much more interesting to me than the mysteries uh, of the infinite. But I doubted that there'd be a general enthusiastic response to that, so we're back to just sort of some general reminiscences and perhaps not too scholarly. As my academic colleagues know, in 45 years of teaching, you're occasionally asked to describe your teaching philosophy. Uh, maybe you're looking for a job, or maybe you're reporting on your department, or you're up for promotion. And I'll have to admit but then in 45 years, I've always used the same phrase. And so I thought it would be a shame to not use it, not to use it uh, today. I don't know if I just assumed that I'd have a different audience for each report, or whether Dean McQuarrie just, you know, stamped them received and put them in a drawer someplace. No. But um, the quote I've always used is from Aristotle and from his poetics. And of course, originally it's in Greek, but my favorite English translation of it is, coming to know is the liveliest pleasure. In Aristotle, the emphasis is always on the activity, on the coming to know, not the knowing. Because once you arrive at some point, like knowing, um, then there's stasis, it's the end. So it's always the activity. And in Aristotle, pleasure is the highest end. So coming to know is not just a pleasure, but the liveliest pleasure. So for my students, the goal has always been to make coming to know a lively pleasure. Um, how one goes about doing that, I think, differs from teacher to teacher. But I was watching Anthony Bourdain, and he was talking to a very old woman in some village someplace. And she said the secret was passion et patience. Sounds better in French than in English. but passion and patience. And I thought that was actually a pretty good formula. But my focus today, rather than on coming to know the students, is actually two sort of unexpected directions that my career took, two areas in which I came to know after I started teaching, and experiences that really were lively pleasures. We're used to thinking, to go back to Aristotle, we're used to thinking that happiness arises out of character. We get in the poetics where character is state. But there's an older concept of happiness and, and of what happens to you, and that's the wheel of fortune. You're up, and then the wheel turns, despite what you may do, and then you're down. It's out of our hands. Indeed, the word happiness comes from the word half, which just means chance. Uh, my English colleagues are likely to know it perhaps from the Thomas, po Thomas Hardy poem called Half, which is about chance. And these <clears throat> two directions that my career took were pure chance, pure half. Uh, they were serendipity. I was going to ask, uh, I was going to give bonus points for anybody who could help me the origin of the word serendipity, but then I realized that most of you would just whip out your cell phones and Google it, <laughs> and I don't really have that many bonus points to go around. <laughs> so the first, which Donna did touch on. When I was in graduate school at the University of Oklahoma, which probably isn't known for its English department, uh, indeed when I got there we had a president who was famous for saying, that he wanted to have a university the football team could be proud of. Um, <laughs> my favorite professor was a history professor, and he had done several books editing the letters of Supreme Court Justice Brandeis. And I had always thought, this would be a wonderful project, editing people's letters. Uh, but I hadn't gotten any farther than thinking about it. And so one day, Virginia Pruitt was in my office, <clears throat> and in those days, Menninger, when Menninger was flourishing, 
we used to have lots of many uh, patients who would take classes of Washburn, and they often would stick around long after they had actually left Menninger's. And one of these students named Pete was in the office and said, somebody should really do something about Dr. Carl. Somebody should write his biography. And so Virginia and I thought, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. And at that time, Dr. Carl was coming to Washburn uh, one day a week. I don't think, Dr. Carl's reputation probably has, it's been 20 years, but probably hasn't survived. But he was, an ex he was large, he was loud, he was formidable, he was intimidating, he certainly wasn't tactful. Uh, so I don't think many people actually went over to see him, but Virginia and I went over to see him. And we suggested writing his biography, and he said it was already being written. Now, it turned out that the man who was writing the biography, when he presented a draft of it to Dr. Carl, Dr. Carl was so unhappy and caused so many problems that the man finally died before the biography could be written. <laughs> and then that was passed on to a second person. Same story. The man died. The biography <laughs> wasn't written. So, you know, perhaps it was actually a good thing but Virginia and I didn't get to do the biography or there wouldn't have been a last lecture today. Um, and indeed, when the, book, when the book came out, Menninger, the family, and the clinic, about the family and the clinic, the family was so unhappy that they closed the archives. Um, so the biography, not a great start. But then I just said, sort of casually, thinking of my OU history professor, I said, how about your letters? And Dr. Carl's face lit up. And he said, I have saved every letter I've written and received from 1919 to the present. Okay. So, Virginia, Dr. Pruitt, Virginia and I went out to the nice Swanger building, which unfortunately has since been destroyed on the beautiful old Menninger campus. And there was a room that had literally tens of thousands of letters for Dr. Carl. The walls were lined with bookcases, with folders, with a letter. Down the center of the room were filing cabinets with letters. I mean, tens of thousands. And we had no idea what we were about to discover. But serendipitously, what we did discover was that we had the whole history of the heyday of American psychiatry and psychoanalysis in front of us. Um, we were lucky in that there were very few handwritten letters, either true or from. Most were typed, and the ones Dr. Carl had sent were typed using carbon paper. Actually, this is a rather uh, middle-aged audience, so some of you may remember carbon paper, but you know the young people don't remember carbon paper. On to onion skin, this very thin paper, but at least they were at least they were typed. And so we just started working our way through them. And some of them were obviously unimportant. You know, some were bread and butter notes or invitations or arrangements of various kinds. But others <coughs> were really substantive. And one of the initial decisions we made after we started winnowing these down, one of the initial decisions we made was that we wanted to include the letters to and from Dr. Carl. And this created a problem in terms of copyright, because letters, of course, aren't copyrighted. So if you send me a letter, the letter now physically is my property. I can burn it, I can sell it, I can save it. But the words on the page remain yours forever, because there's no copyright. Okay? We got some particularly bad advice from lawyers about this, but we finally found out how it worked. Um, Although I have no idea now in the age of emails how it worked, but it was a different era, obviously. So our first job was to track down, I mean, we're starting in 1919. Our first job was to track down the heirs of the people who we wanted to print. There were 55 we wanted to print because we had to get permission, you know, from the heirs and sometimes grandchildren, sometimes it's very hard. Uh, and this was the early 80s in which there was no internet and there was no Google, and there was just the old-fashioned telephone and yellow pages. Uh, so I think we were more like detectives than we were like scholars. We spent a lot of time 
Luckily, because so many of them were psychoanalysts, they tended to settle in big cities and to stay in big cities once they, once they uh, settled there. But we managed somehow to track down all 55 of the people, uh, or the heirs of all 55 of the people. And surprisingly, only two people said no. The other 53 letters published their letters. And what was surprising to us, many people said yes without even asking to see the letters. They just said yes. So <clears throat> we did that. And we worked with Dr. Carl uh, about one day a week. And we got along pretty well with him. Because everybody would say, how often do you see Dr. Carl? Did you see him? And when we say we see him once a week, almost everybody's reaction was, oh, I feel so sorry for you. Um, but we did pretty well. There were, there were certain rules. You certainly couldn't chew gum. You would see nobody who, had, who was chewing gum. I had to put on a tie. I didn't even bother today to put on a tie. I had to put on a tie to see him or he wouldn't see you. Virginia had to put on a dress. Um, and he loved to test us. He loved to test us on politics and poetry. And his idea of poetry was primarily people like Longfellow and Whittier. And he'd sit in his chair and he'd pound up the rhythms, you know, these 19th century poems, but somewhere from the deep recesses of, you know, high school or graduate school or somewhere, we could usually remember what the poem was. So we passed, we passed his test. I remember one year we um, met with Dr. Carl <clears throat> at a certain hour every week, and the hour before that there were the residents in psychiatry at Menninger. And the residents, you know, they're late 30s, 40-year-olds, and we would see them coming out before we went in, and they would be absolutely pale-faced, just shaken and pale-faced. And we go in to see Dr. Carl, and Dr. Carl would say, those are just the most narrow-minded, least educated people I've ever met with. They know nothing about, you know, and he'd do his rattle off his big list, and then he'd say, and what I don't understand is that they have this great resource in me here, and they never come to see me. <laughs> so not, not always a uh, keen judge of character. So we, we worked really, really hard. We finally edited and edited and threw away, and, you know, and we got it down in, in typed manuscript to 1,500 pages, which is a lot. Of, and of course, when it was published, there weren't nearly that many pages, but that was, okay. <coughs> and at this point, Dr. Carl had never really read any of what we had chosen. Um, but it was just too hard for somebody who was 90 years old to read the, uh, the faded onion skin. So he would ask us questions, but you know, we'd read a little bit and then he'd get bored. He had an incredible long-term memory. I mean, because psychiatry is both Dr. Burr and I are in English, so we sort of lack the overall background. Um, and uh, we would ask him questions about somebody, you know, in 1923, so-and-so met Helene Deutsch. Do you remember anything about Helene Deutsch? But, you know, this is like 60 years earlier, and he could remember every detail. Now, I have to admit, he was much better remembering things about women than he was about men. <laughs> uh, but, but he remembered. So, <clears throat> you know, it was, uh, it was really valuable for us. He enjoyed it. You know, and everything was going really, really well until we had these 1,500 pages which he hadn't seen. We sent it off to Yale, which had agreed to publish, and of course we were just overjoyed because Yale's prestigious and we thought we'd hit the jackpot here. <clears throat> and then Virginia got a telephone call at what time? Nine in the morning. Okay, nine in the morning from Dr. Carl saying he wanted to see us immediately. And we went to his office and he had had I mean, the photocopy machines must have overheated because he had had 10 copies of this made. So there were 15,000 pages of the manuscript stacked in his office. And he had his nephews and his son and some psychiatrists and his lawyer because he was so infuriated about what was in here, even though we'd censored a whole bunch. Um, and Dr. Carl had a flair for the dramatic, so we, we knew, of course, his nephews and son. Uh, but when he introduced to his lawyer, he said to the lawyer, "These are my friend, these are my former friends, <laughs> Doctor Good and Doctor." Uh. Um, but finally, the psychiatrists out there, some that he trusted, were 
were very helpful to us, and we, we went over it. And of those that we selected, we, we got it published. And so that was the first volume. And you know we were really, really happy. And just again, how the wheel of fate can turn, or if you like Christian terms better, how pride goeth before a fall. The uh, Journal of the American Medical Association gave it a wonderful review. The Sunday Washington Post did a wonderful review on the front page of the Sunday Book World. And then I was in Tulsa visiting a graduate school friend I hadn't seen in many, many years. We were in a bookstore. There was, a, there was the New York Times, the Sunday New York Times. I got the book review section. We weren't on the front page, but we were in it. You know, I was cavelling. I'm sure I was obnoxious. I opened it, and the New York Times reviewer panned absolutely everything about the book, including uh, our competence to have written it in the first place. So, you know, that'll teach me. So that led to two volumes of his professional correspondence, and I think valuable volumes because they do talk about the history of American psychiatry. But once more, serendipity intervened. In the middle of the room, there were these, like, I don't know, 10 or 12 filing cabinets back to back, and everything in them was so unbelievably disorganized. They were all letters, but, you know, that every time we looked in, we just got disheartened. I thought, you know, we'll put this off for another day. But one day we were looking in there, and we found a whole stack of letters from a period 1930 to 1932 when Dr. Carl had been a an advice columnist, sort of like Ann Landers, for the Ladies Home Journal. And this seemed to have been like an absolutely forgotten period of his life. Nobody actually knew, I mean, nobody remembered this. And so we knew we had hit on an absolute treasure trove. The letters were nothing like the letters to, to Ann Landers, uh, or you know, nothing like the telephone calls to Laura Schlesinger. These were long, thank God, these were long, <laughs> articulate letters from women from all over the country in the Great Depression. We put off dealing with them until we finished the two volumes of the professional correspondence, and then we had had these letters. And evidently, there'd been uh, many, many more that had just been burned by an overzealous secretary. But even among the 3,000 or so that we found, they were wonderful, wonderful letters. And the letters to him, um, were much more interesting in, than his responses. For one thing, he was at the height of his love of psychoanalysis. So no matter what pro problem the woman had, or the, you know, because there were women who were, uh, they needed to be psychoanalyzed. And if there wasn't a psychoanalyst in your small town, you needed to move to Los Angeles immediately, no matter what problem. Uh, since the King's Speech is in every, you know, everybody's talking about the King's Speech, stammering. I mean, letters about stammering. Obviously, you were suffering from an Oedipus complex, and therefore you had to go to a psychiatrist. <laughs> and that was, that was it. So his answers weren't particularly interesting. The one thing that was a little bit interesting about his answers is that there were so many letters. He was so overwhelmed by this that he had to hire somebody to help him. And Dr. Carl had been in a 15-year marriage or so with his first wife, Grace. But the woman he hired to help him, and he began having an affair uh, that lasted for 10 years before they finally got married. And she actually wrote most of the responses. He would look at the letter and scribble something on it, and then she would write the response. And they were particularly interesting because the major problem, the most common problem, was adultery, the philandering husband. Okay, And so, Here's the woman writing for Dr. Carl, and it's always the same advice. The first advice, the first part of the advice was uh, that the woman hadn't been cheerful enough. If she'd just been more cheerful, he wouldn't have needed to, to philander. And then if the woman had found out about it indirectly, not that her husband hadn't confessed, Dr. Carl, through Jean, or actually Jean, would always write, did it ever occur to you that he was just decently trying to spare your feelings? But the letters were interesting. And so that was volume three. And then, again, serendipitously, I mean, totally by chance, none of this was planned, none of this had to do with my dissertation or the direction of my, you know, my graduate career had taken. Um, one, of, one of Dr. Carl's psychiatric mentors 
was named Smith Eli Jellop, and his wife Belinda Jellop, who had written a novel, wrote these wonderful sort of, I use the word ribald always, but that's not a word people use much anymore, is that? I mean, they were sort of dirty. Uh, she couldn't spell, she couldn't write. She was, but her novel had been published, and they were hilarious. And she was also a friend of Thomas Wolfe, who wrote, uh, you know, Look Homeward Angel, You Can't Go Home Again, and of his editor, editor Maxwell Perkins. Well, Yale would let us put the letters in the volume of professional correspondence, but um, they were so interesting, and her novel was so interesting, and then just by finding somebody who knew her, we found two of her unpublished short stories, because she burned almost everything else she ever wrote. And so out of that arose a fourth book, in which we did a critical edition of her novel. So, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience. And again, it was all serendipity. The second experience, second strain here, is what Donna mentioned about teaching abroad. If for the many a thing, I, I do have an idea of how it started. For the Fulbrights, I actually have no memory whatsoever. I mean, I'm sure I just got a brochure and on a whim, you know, said, oh, okay, I'll apply for a Fulbright to teach, abro to teach abroad. Um, and for a Fulbright, you apply for a specific country. And the only reason I applied, the first country I went to is now Macedonia, but it was not a part of Yugoslavia. And it was just because a friend had been to Yugoslavia and said it was really pretty. So I said, okay, I'll go to, you, to Yugoslavia. And that began, after that, Macedonia, then France, then Bulgaria, and finally Morocco. I mean, four just wonderful, fascinating years of my life. Um, one thing, since I do teach the grammar, did teach the grammar course, I mean, just for the language. Um, I just got discovered that I just loved learning languages for their own sake. It's not that I'm going to come back to Topeka and have lively conversations in the Macedonian community here in Topeka, <laughs> because it's going to be sort of like talking to myself. Um, <laughs> and also the power of language, and that Macedonian and Bulgarian are very, very close. And when I taught in Bulgaria, first of all, when I was in Macedonia, when I was in Yugoslavia, uh, Tito died. And uh, everybody thought we were supposed to be going to be invaded by the Bulgarians, which Maria knows is probably not likely to happen at that point. But, you know, we're all supposed to stay in our house. Nobody did, but we were supposed to. And when Bulgaria and the Macedonians finally got together, one of the big disputes was like the Vietnamese Treaty Talks, where they had trouble arguing about the shape of the table. Well, this one was the, the Bulgarian prime minister insisted that there not be a translator because they were the same language. And Macedonia was just a dialect of Bulgarian. And the Macedonian insisted that they had to have a translator because they were two different languages. And when I was in Bulgaria, I cannot tell you how many times people said, well, you studied both. What do you think? Uh -huh. And I would say, if I was honest or didn't mind having a conversation, I'd say, I think they're two different languages. If I wanted to flatter the Bulgarian or just get it over with, I would say, yes, Macedonian is a dialect of Bulgarian. And if I really didn't like the Bulgarian, I would say, you know, I think Bulgarian's a, a dialect of Macedonian. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't like that, did they? No. <laughs> um, so, you know, learning these strange languages, they're like Russian, they're Slavic languages, they're written in Cyrillic. I remember that in Yugoslavia, the first sentence I learned was Chai Moya Tejava. She is my frog. And <laughs> that was because, um, the housing was really short, and I was staying with an American couple, and they had brought Kermit the Frog with them. And so it was like, but you, you, you really learned a lot of grammar. I mean, you learned that, first of all, Java is always feminine, and therefore poor Kermit didn't have any choice. He had suddenly become a she in the sentence. And that the word for my is just moi, but you had to make it feminine and singular, so it was moya. And then you had to add ta, which is the, at the end of the word. Now Maria's going to correct my Bulgarian. But then when I, I remember when I learned Bulgarian, it was worse. I, I went over to KU and got the Bulgarian textbook that had been written during the communist era. And it was very serious and it was very good. And the first sentence I remember learning in Bulgarian was, <laughs> You want to translate it for me? Tutuno <laughs> robotnicite. Tobacco. Tobacco workers are very happy. Yeah, that's right. The tobacco <laughs> workers are very happy. And, um, you know, if it's a communist worker's paradise, but we don't want disgruntled 
tobacco workers, certainly. On the other hand, I was a little bit worried about why I wasn't writing My Name is Howard and Where is the Train Station? <laughs> Things like that. Um, but it was a great advantage once you were there. I mean, it, it built up so much goodwill that here was an American who would speak Bulgarian or Macedonian or a little bit of Arabic when I was in Morocco. Um, it, you know, it, it enabled you to, to immerse yourself really in the culture. You, your friends didn't have to be only people who taught at the university. When I was in Skopje, Macedonia, because there wasn't a country, there wasn't, you know, there weren't embassies. So I think, I think there were eight American speakers there, English speakers there. The, the three of us who lived together, uh, the director of the American Center and his wife, two rather forlorn Mormon missionaries who weren't having a great deal of luck. Uh, and then one guy who was there to be inspired for his writing, and what we always assumed was that he was CIA. Certainly in Bulgaria, my best American friend was CIA. But you, you learned also that you didn't really ask questions about that kind of thing. Um, the experience of living in the culture is a wonderful. The experience of teaching in the culture is was a little bit frustrating sometimes. How long do I have? Because I could just go on and on, but I, it's supposed to end at? Uh, 3.40. I, I mean, there were some commonalities in all of the teaching which was frustrating. I mean, for one thing, there's no general education there. Once you go to school, you take only whatever your major is. <laughs> and that meant, for example, <clears throat> that um, the teachers could make up your, your schedule if it suited me to teach the cor my course at 9 a.m. and it suited Laura to teach the, her English course, we'll say, at 4.30 p.m., well, who cared about the students who were, you know? You didn't have to do anything to accommodate the students. It was up to them. They, they were all thinking exactly the same thing. When I, the first day in Yugoslavia, first day of classes, there was still no schedule. And we met, we were all sitting around the teacher's lounge drinking rakia and making up the schedule, and I thought that was sort of strange, but at least we did get it made up. In Morocco, um, it took the first, classes were supposed to begin, and the King Hassan II of Morocco didn't like the city I was in, Meknes, and because it was a political city and a sort of rebellious city. So there were three branches of the university, and they were all on the outskirts of the city and separated, because he didn't want student rebellion. And they were all walled in, and you had to show a pass to, to get in. And for the students to get from the center to this, the transportation was very, very difficult, and they thought it was expensive. Um, and for the first month, the professors, and I didn't have anything better to do, so I sat out with them. I mean, we sat around and drank coffee all day long and spent maybe 10 minutes working on the schedule and the rest of the day complaining about uh, <laughs> So after a month, the schedule had been made up, but then it was Ramadan, and even though we were supposed to have an abbreviated teaching schedule during Ramadan, the students didn't show up. So now we're in the middle of November, and I haven't actually taught yet. <laughs> and you know, it's, I mean, it's OK with me in some ways. But um, so we do have some, some classes, but the students were always on strike. And so I would teach for like five minutes, and the door of my classroom would burst open, and all these people would come in. and. You know, I'd seen my students so seldom that I wasn't sure if these were my students or <laughs> if these were the strike leaders, but they would come bursting in and start screaming, and then all my students would go out. And, and the big, the big dis dispute of the year was that um, they had decided, because in all the European countries and the North African system was modeled after France particularly, there are, no, there are no controls in the course of the year. All you have is an exam at the end of the year. That's it. And so the university had decided they were going to institute midterms, which meant December. And so the students went on strike about that. That seemed like a good thing to go on strike about, right? And I mean, they did beat up Professor Amar and break out his, the window in his car and slash his tires. So but by Thursday, when I was going to give my one midterm, and it was sort of hard. If I'd only seen the students like three or four times, it was kind of hard to have a midterm over the first. But so I came to the building with my little paper, you know, the midterms in my hand, but I knew that they weren't going to take them. So they all were standing outside waiting for me, and they said, are we having a midterm? And I said, um, well, no, but I've got what I would have given you, so let's just go in and um, 
you know, we can go over it, and then you can see what kind of tests I do give, and, you know, it'll be good practice for, for the end of the year. So they all agreed, and we all went in, and then the strike leaders came in, and they started screaming, and then the students told them they wanted to stay, and the strike leaders were really PO'd because the students wanted to stay, and then a fight broke out, and the students, like, gathered around me and said, you know, stay out of this one, this is really just not a good one. I'm thinking about Professor Omar's car. Right. Is this is cut it short. Okay. So you're going to miss all sorts of stories about people beating, <laughs> beating each other up. About okay. So to conclude, Donna, <laughs> uh, and just to return to my roots, and Donna, if you pass out the poems, I want to just look at a poem. Since American literature is really my field. Uh, it's a poem you all know, The Road Not Taken, and I want to convince you that you've all been misreading it, and uh, let's see what it really means. Okay? Even before you get your copy, we all know Robert Frost's poem, right? The Road Not Taken. Scott Peck made a million dollars on his book, you know. And we all know that, you know, there's several paths in life. And once you take one path, you can't take the other one. And you know you should not be afraid to take the path less traveled by, et cetera, et cetera. And all that's perfectly true, but it's too true, right? It's like a truism. It's like every graduation speech you've ever heard, right? So I put the title of what I thought was a sort of artsy-fartsy type that would go with this sort of self-help idea. <laughs> But if you look at the first three stanzas, which are the three I think that people usually focus on, a couple of things. One is Frost's favorite conjunction in these stanzas is clearly and. It's and, and, and. And and does not convey a lot of causality. It's just sort of one damn thing after another. <laughs> and the other thing, the most important thing, which people totally overlook, is that he says very plainly that he doesn't take the road less traveled by. He says in stanza two, <clears throat> because it was grassy and wanted wear, but, you know, as far as that goes, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay and leaves no step. So it's not really about taking the road less traveled by, okay? But I think what everybody overlooks is the last stanza. So I shall be telling this with a sigh. I mean, usually it's a sigh of regret isn't it? But if it's a sigh of regret, that doesn't go with what we usually think the poem's about. Somewhere ages and ages hence, here's the bad news, we don't get ages and ages, you know? So we've got this sort of melodramatic ages and ages hence. Two roads diverged in a wood and I, melodramatic pause, I took the one less traveled by. Right? And Frost is a skilled uh, skilled with meter and rhyme. He certainly could have found another word if he didn't want this repetition of I. I took the one less traveled by. No, he didn't. And that has made all the difference. Frost was a cranky and cynical old man. A poem called Neither Out Far Nor In Deep. People can look out into the ocean or in deep into the land, but it doesn't make any difference. They don't see anything. They don't look neither out far nor in deep. So what is this difference? So it seems to me this poem isn't about what most people think it's about. It's really about our own tendency to dramatize our own lives, our love of sort of self-dramatization. I realize that I've used the word I an awful lot in this, but I hope I haven't sighed very often. It's certainly not ages and ages hence that I'm telling it. And I didn't make any conscious choice about the roads. They just sort of spun out in front of me, but I came to know a lot that it was indeed a very lively pleasure.
will present him with a framed cover and the description of the last lecture. Acknowledge the foundation, uh, the Washburn Foundation will make a donation on uh, his behalf to his scholarship fund. So he will, thank with his last much. lecture, again serve students. And so we thank him very much. I understand that there are an incredible display. Uh,